Hello, welcome to this brief on ledger-based authorizations. Uh, ledger-based authorizations are a concept taken from the blockchain world. Uh, it's a method to authorize into software systems. We will start this video by going to a medium.com article. Um, the link is the first link below in the description. Uh, this article is also available on GitHub. The link is also below. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, Ledger-based authorization is a very simple concept. If we consider this ledger to be a public source of truth uh, for payments from uh, Fred to Acme Company or Mick to Globex Incorporated, uh, and we have some method of vetting who Fred is, that means for Fred to actually prove that he is Fred and for Mick to prove that he is Mick, then we can be sure that payments that have been received within whatever number of days ago, so this one says yesterday, uh, that these payments authorize Fred into a certain tier of access uh, into Acme Company based on on this proof that Fred is who he, he who he says he is. So at this point uh, we have Fred authenticating in some method into this public ledger and Acme Co just needs to check this ledger to say yep Fred is authorized. Since uh, we're dealing with a public ledger we certainly don't want Fred uh, to identify himself as Fred uh, in plain sight. So this is where cryptography comes in. And this little table is basically the same table as before, except Fred is now this this 20 byte string. And Acme Co is also this 20 byte string. They're pseudonymous addresses, public addresses on this ledger. So now uh, Thread pseudonymously identifies as this crazy string um, and there's a corresponding secret key to this address and whomever has access to that secret key essentially proves ownership of this address. So presumably Fred has access to the secret key or the corresponding secret key in his Ethereum wallet and that way he can prove that he is who he is on this ledger. Uh, the same goes for Acme. The Acme's public key is publicly visible and uh, they, the admins of Acme, they have the secret key and having access to the secret key proves ownership of this address. Before getting into the ledger based authorization approach and seeing what that workflow looks like, let's just consider today's most popular workflow OAuth 2 which is used for most social logins. So here uh, this is figure number two, we'll just start there and uh, we'll just go through basically OAuth 2 flow, which is usually familiar to software users as, as a social sign-on today. That's just an application of, of this OAuth flow. Uh, so let's start at the top. Um, so assuming that this is a user logging into a software application, uh, within the app client, so in the browser or, or mobile app, uh, we're mostly going to use browsers as examples. Uh, the user is usually greeted with some sort of a pop-up and they enter their authentication details. Um, there is no authorization at this point. Uh, what happens is um, some sort of a social login provider, maybe Google, is being used uh, to host this dialog and uh, you log in with um, Google credentials into who, who, whomever uh, is the service provider, whoever wrote the app. So now we're in the back end. Uh, our user has passed in a, their credentials through the social login provider. We have a token that validates that this user is whomever they are with Google or Facebook or whomever. Now, if we actually want to authorize, because what we've done so far is authenticate, uh, the social login just authenticated. If we, if we want to authorize into some sort of a payment tier with our application, then we need to interact with a payment gateway. And in order to do that, we need to match up the login, the authentication, with previous payments. Uh, so necessarily we get into the business of having a user's database to do this matching. So we touched on one problem with the social login approach, which is that the authentication and authorization pieces are separate and you still need this glue layer, this user's database in order to map the two together. Another problem with the social login approach is that it is social login and you're being track to your information is being recorded on, on what you do and who you visit. Now, 
One last problem, uh, despite social logging being extremely popular, uh, there was a huge benefit to using the, the old way of, of having usernames and passwords, which was you were in control of your credentials. Uh, with social login, you're necessarily tying, as a user, you're necessarily tying your use of, of this app to the lifecycle of the social login provider. So if this app is useful to you beyond uh, the social login provider existing, um, down the road you might have a hard time getting back into the app. On the other hand, despite the issues highlighted about social login and with OAuth 2, there are some nice anti-phishing countermeasures that OAuth 2 does provide. Uh, this is provided through the re redirect URL that's part of the OAuth 2 protocol. That's enough on the current way of doing things. I'm going to switch to another document, uh, which is also linked in the description. It's this remuneration API markdown document in uh, GitHub. And this diagram just uh, shows a basic overview of ledger-based authorization. In this diagram, we have a user named S for the service provider. This is the app developer. We have a user named U. This is the user of the app developer. And we'll just go through the ledger-based authorization flow. The app developer would share their public key probably within their app to the users. And this way, the users are able to create transactions on a ledger uh, using knowing who to pay, which is the public key of the software developer. The private keys are necessarily kept private. Those aren't shared anywhere. Once the app developer's public key is shared with the user, the user can create a transaction, which is step two, on the public ledger. The transactions would be in the amounts that the app developer is asking for for certain authorization tiers. Um, so authorization will come in a sec, but first the user has to authenticate that they are who they are. This can be done fully in the client software. The user doesn't need to go beyond the browser and the wallets inside of the browser to authenticate. Authentication involves signing with the private key of the user, the public address of the user, and being able to validate the signature validates that the user in fact does own that address. The user's signature, which proves that the user is the owner of this address is sent to the app developer's backend, which is represented by the server stack. The backend then can take the user address and check for a sum of all the transactions from the user's public key to the app developer's public key, tally it up over a period of time. So let's say the authorization tier requires that some number of funds was paid in the last five days. They can easily check that against the public ledger now the users authenticated, the backend authorizes that there are in fact enough transactions to tally to the amount. Now the backend can tell the client side of the application, yes, this person is authorized for this tier. The final piece here is this dollar sign circle, which represents the fact that the user transactions to the app developer are value transfers on a blockchain that's usually a cryptocurrency and the funds are now available to the app developer. Now, in order to for the app developer to withdraw those funds as fiat money, they would go to an exchange, they would transfer um, the funds given to them by the users to the exchange's address and uh, after some conversion, extract fiat money, US dollars or euros. This is the case with ledgers or public ledgers that are cryptocurrency blockchains. Um, now I want to introduce the overhide ledger, which is what I've been working on. And in overhide ledger, it's a public ledger, but the transactions on it are receipts of fiat money transfers somewhere else. As such, with overhide ledger, there is no value transfer on the public ledger, although it still uses the cryptography, the authentication through the public key infrastructure, and the public ledger still is useful for authorizations. Uh, the ledger itself are just pseudonymous receipts. Uh, more detail on, on this concept of pseudonymous receipts and overhead ledger is back at the Medium article we started with. Once again, the link is in the description. And there's another view of the ledger-based authorization that we just went through. 
and it's sort of contrasting to the OAuth social login flow that we started this video with. Uh, once again, in this in this view, the user starts at the top, logging into an app client. Um, now, instead of using uh, social login, they're using um, PKI from some ledger, in this case, overhead ledger or Ethereum, and the authentication credentials, the signed public address, is passed into the backend, and the backend can verify that indeed um, the signature matches the public address of the user passed in, and they can simply tally up the transactions for authorization against the ledger that's indicated. There is no need to actually know who the user is. There is no need for a database matching user logins to payments received. Uh, authorizations are simply determined using the ledger and authentication is simply determined using the, the blockchain PKI. Uh, so now the backend can pass information to the application client saying, yes, this person is authorized. Thanks kindly for your time and for watching this video. Uh, we will revisit ledger-based authorizations when we discuss overhead ledger in subsequent videos, so I hope you come back. Bye.